We are going to look at some sensory zones that you could consider for your classroom or whatever setting that you are in. Let's start with the gustatory system. Uh, the mouth, the tongue, and the sense of taste. So anything inside of your mouth, including all of the skin in your cheeks and the roof of your mouth, um, all of the pieces that are inside of your mouth as a sensory system. So the mouth is a part of the gustatory system. It's a, the mouth is a powerful regulator tool. Uh, and this is why we see young kids, if anyone has ever had to uh, take a bottle or a passy from a young kid or an older kid, it is tough. Um, it is very hard to get them to give those things up because that deep pressure, that sucking as we do it, puts deep pressure inside of our mouth. Uh, this is why uh, if people eat our comfort eaters, um, I tend to be a stress eater. So, uh, because my mouth is a powerful regulator tool, right? So, um, just being aware of that and knowing that on the flip side, if you work in education or if you have a kid who struggles with sensory processing disorder, that we can use the mouth, hopefully, to help with some calming or alerting activities. And we're going to talk about what those might look like next. So, thinking about calming and alerting activities for the gustatory system or the mouth. Right? So uh, when I worked in the classroom, I had students who struggled with, um, struggled with sensory processing issues and they were on a sensory diet. And we're gonna talk about what that is later on. It doesn't necessarily have to do with food, um, but we'll explain that more in detail later. But um, a part of their sensory diet was calming activities uh, with food. So we used a straw to suck up um, they really enjoyed pudding and applesauce and yogurt. So we took a small straw and they ate their yogurt uh, or their pudding cup. We just popped the straw right through the top of the lid and they would suck it through. They started every day with, with that activity uh, and it helped them regulate their sensory system. Um, getting kids to suck on a piece of fruit before they eat it. It could be um, ice, cold foods, if you want to alert kids. You have a kid who is um, sleepy or they're, they're very low energy level. Maybe you need to prep them up or maybe you need to prep your, pop, prop yourself up during the day. Cold foods such as popsicles or even just crunching on ice can um, help alert your sensory system for the mouth. Wake yourself back up. Eating crunchy, chewy foods, um, anything that you can do along those lines can help uh, alert or calm and sometimes it takes a little bit of practice because these may vary from kid to kid. Uh, what might be calming for one person might be alerting uh, for another. So we're going to move on to a new system. So let's look at our proprioceptive sensory system. So what is proprioceptive? Um, it's the ability of the body to know where it's at in space and the ability to safely maneuver in that environment. So when you bend your knee, you can tell where your foot is going. And on the same hand, if someone else took your foot and moved your foot up and down or moved your foot to the left or right, you should be able to feel where that body part is still. You should be able to tell where the body part is, whether you're moving it or someone else, if you have good proprioceptive receptors in your body. Students who struggle with proprioception um, may need support in the following areas or may um, these are ways that we can support them. So students with proprioception issues um, may do things like walk on their toes, have a, be very clumsy, have a hard time knowing where their body is at in space. Um, they bump into other kids in line uh, and they may stay constantly in motion because they cannot tell where their body parts are. So some things that we can do for calming, uh, for proprioception, think heavy work activities. Um, so push or pull a cart or a wagon that has some books or items in it. Maybe run a vacuum. Um, pushing that vacuum across the floor will give you some proprioceptive input. Um, carry boxes, laundry baskets. When um, I've had students that struggle with proprioception and one of the things that we did was um, he had a backpack uh, in front of the classroom 
And if his teacher uh, out in the regular classroom could tell that he was getting extra wiggly uh, or they were about to do an activity that she felt like he would need to get up and have some deep pressure input before he did this activity, she would have him put on the backpack and take an item to the office. And it was prearranged with the office that they knew if he showed up wearing that backpack with a note, they would just um, write something on a sticky note and send it back to the teacher. And it gave him a walk and it gave him a little bit of heavy work input. So think heavy work items. Jumping into spongy pillows or a crash pad, things like if we're outdoors, a monkey bar, uh, hanging from a monkey bar is gonna give you some good deep pressure. Um, if we're looking for alerting activities, dance or wiggle, we see a lot of classrooms now that do things like go noodle, and I think that's great. Um, getting up, getting some movement in your joints, your hips, um, those kinds of activities are going to be wonderful for proprioceptive input. We're going to look at our vestibular system. So the vestibular input, it, so it, what it does is it coordinates the movement of the eyes, the head, and the body. And it's based a lot on our inner ear, right? So it's affecting our body's balance. Um, if you don't have good balance, then you're probably going to have poor muscle tone. Uh, it also affects things like emotional security. If you don't have a good sense of balance, then you're going to feel frightened frequently. You're going to become upset more easily because you can't coordinate uh, your eyes, head, and body posture. Um, so that would be very, a very disruptive feeling. So calming activities for our vestibular system. So think things like swinging and rocking, but not just swinging on any particular manner, but in a calm, linear, um, rhythmical motion. So we're going to go back and forth in a nice, slow manner in a pattern. And same thing with rocking. We're going back and forth in a rocking chair uh, in a slow, rhythmical manner, um, trying to bring down that vestibular system. Um, jumping on a trampoline, uh, going through an obstacle course, um, will help improve your vestibular system. If we're trying to alert, if we have a student who needs their energy level brought back up or they're seeking out a lot of sensory activities for vestibular system, um, think about spinning in a chair. <laughs> your, your students who like to spin in a chair, ride a scooter, um, somersets, uh, somersaults and cartwheels, jumping up and down in a bouncy house or on a trampoline if you have access to that. Um, also, if you've ever seen, if anyone has worked with young children or if they have their own child, um, little ones who are learning their vestibular system will stand and put their head on the floor, right, and look backwards between their legs. If you've ever seen a baby do this, they are learning about their vestibular system. They are learning their balance points. Um, so I always thought that was an interesting fact when I learned about the vestibular system. So let's take a look at our tactile sensory system. So think touch and texture, right? Um, it's all the skin of the body. And so what is tactile sensory? Um, it's the ability to process the tactile input and it comes back directly related to our ability to visually discriminate. It affects our motor planning and body awareness. Um, it also helps us develop emotional security social skills and academic learning all come back to the tactile sensory system. Uh, so think about if you're in a classroom and you have those students who never sit down, they need to stand up beside their desk. That could be a tactile issue. Um, kids who suddenly um, they need to reach out and touch everything and everyone around them, they are seeking out that tactile input, right? Uh, which can cause a lot of issues because sometimes that touch could be a hard pinch or it could be a push, <laughs> and um, which causes lots of issues. Now, on the reverse side of that, if they are a tactile avoiding um, sensory person, then they don't like to be touched. They don't like to be bumped. They don't want anyone to sit too close to them. So if it's time to sit in circle and we're all on the carpet, they're the child who is um, freaked out by people sitting on either side of them and people sitting behind them because they don't want to be bumped accidentally. Um, those things are very upsetting for them. 
So they are constantly avoiding other kids or other adults because they don't want to be touched. Uh, so that can cause lots of struggles when we think about that in a school setting. So we're going to look at some ways to support tactile sensory issues. So thinking calming for tactile, um, I go with weighted vest, weighted lap pads. And this is usually the point in this training where I talk about the importance of working with an occupational therapist because how much weight is appropriate, right? Knowing um, how much weight is appropriate can be um, very important. Uh, so for a weighted vest, a weighted lap pad, um, there needs to be also any kind of pressure vest. There has to be rules of when that's worn and when that's not worn. Because if I put a weighted vest on you and you wear it all day, then it loses its effectiveness after 30 minutes to an hour, depending upon the student. So here are some good rules of thumb. But these are, if I'm using weighted vest or I'm using pressure vest, I definitely want to make sure I have an occupational therapist on board who is knowledgeable of those things. Um, for a weighted vest or a weighted lap pad, they should never be more than 10% of the child's body weight, right? It should never be more than 10% of the child's body weight. So if a child weighs 50 pounds, then, then uh, the lap pad or the weighted vest should never be more than 5 pounds. So if a child is 100 pounds, then the weighted vest, weighted lap pad should never weigh more than 10 pounds. Right, so I was in a situation with a young student and they had put him in a 14 pound weighted vest. Um, that's way too heavy. Uh, it can damage your spine. Um, there's all kinds of issues that come along with wearing a weighted vest that's too heavy for your body. So just, I want you to be aware of that. I think that those are great activities, but you have to know what you're doing before you use those. And another good rule of thumb to know is, is that if I put a weighted vest on you and it's the appropriate weight, that's fabulous, but I have to have a protocol of when you are going to wear that weighted vest. So if I put it on you and you wear it for four hours, after 30 minutes to an hour, the your body is desensitized to that weighted vest and it loses its effectiveness. So when I work with students or with my own child, when they wore things like weighted vest or if they used a weighted lap pad then they used it for a specific activity. So I'm not gonna wear a weighted vest to gym, probably, it depends on the kid, right? I'm probably not gonna wear a weighted vest to gym, but I might wear a weighted vest during a sit-down activity um, at the circle, you know, at the, at the round table with an adult or a teacher. Um, maybe I wear a weighted vest for 30 minutes of guided reading, but I take it off when I move on to the next center, and then I put it back on later in the day. Um, just thinking through some of those things and making sure that everyone who's on that child's team is aware of how you're utilizing things like weighted vest. Um, other good calming activities are deep pressure activities. So if we were in person, this is the point where I would say, all right, I need everyone to put their hands underneath of the seat that they're on. I'm assuming you're going to be sitting in a hard chair in some um, lecture hall somewhere or something along those lines and you are going to do what I call a chair push-up. So you're gonna put your hands underneath of your bottom, just on the edge of the chair, and you're gonna lift up your body weight, just barely. It's gonna put deep pressure into your elbows and shoulders. Um, deep pressure activities, we might also do wall push-ups. I could lean against the wall um, and then push back and forth in uh, kind of a pseudo, a pseudo push-up, but I'm doing it off of the wall. Um, these are great activities for giving um, input, deep pressure input, for our tactile system. Alerting activities, and these could be calming, it just depends on the student, so it kind of makes it hard to categorize these activities into either calming or alerting. But um, fidget items, we all saw the fidget spinner craze. <laughs> Teachers everywhere shudder at the sight of them. Um, but there are lots of options for fidget items that are non, not so intrusive as that. I've had good success with kids putting a little bit of soft Velcro or rough Velcro on the bottom side of the desk. It gives them something they can run their finger back and forth across. Um, it's not obvious to other kids that it's there. Um, with my personal child, we did things like fidget items in his pocket when he was young, and it was okay for him to put his hands in his pocket and, and walk around. He would have 
some sort of small fidget item in his pocket. It could be a Hot Wheel. He would spin the wheels on the Hot Wheel, just something that he could reach in there and touch. Um, so just thinking through what's appropriate for the setting uh, and what's appropriate for um, the activity that you're doing. Uh, light touch is alerting. Cold, petting an animal, so thinking about things that, you know, going along with that tactile system, petting things, getting to touch different textures uh, are a great way to give some input to your tactile system. So let's look at our olfactory system, or our sense of smell. Um, for students who have challenges with their olfactory system, um, it could be that they are seeking out um, strong smells or lots of different smells, so they have a strong desire to smell things. Or it could be on the opposite end of olfactory avoiders, kids who dislike strong smells, kids who um, are made sick easily by um, walking into the lunchroom. The different smells of all the foods might become very overwhelming to them um, or could make them physically ill for in some students that I have worked with. So we'll look next at some strategies for the olfactory system. So calming activities and alerting activities for our olfactory system or our sense of our nose, our sense of smell, and, and some breathing issues. So calming activities include giving them a variety of access to different scents. So thinking about scented markers, um, scented lotions or soaps, uh, and generally speaking, calming scents are considered vanilla, rose, lavender, um, and thinking about how can I include scented activities into academic tasks. So maybe we're using a scented marker to write our answer, or maybe I put some of the questions on the paper in a scented marker to help draw that, um, meet that need of the sensory need for olfactory system. I had a student that we worked with that was constantly seeking out uh, acti any kind of things to smell. Um, and so one of the tools that we made for her was a box of scents. And I took the plastic spice jars um, and emptied them out primarily and included just a box of different scents. And so a part of her day was she would request to have access to that box and we would give it to her and she would just go through and smell things. Uh, and it really brought a ton of enjoyment to her and it became a really good reinforcer that we could use to get um, some good work out of her and to get her to comply with the activities that we needed to happen. Sort of a trade-off, if you sit down and do some math work with me, then you can get your box of scents. Um, so just thinking outside of the box with that. Um, alerting scents are considered citrus, mint, and cinnamon. Um, so just thinking through some of your stronger smells and knowing that for some kids this will be a balancing act that some smells may be uh, upsetting. I've had students become uh, physically ill and vomit from odors before because their olfactory system was on overdrive and so when they smelled certain things and it was things in the lunchroom <laughs> they would vomit um, so that was really tough so we just had to be aware of why that was happening and then work to um, help them address that uh, so if we knew that they were cooking um, chicken noodle soup in the cafeteria he did not go in the he did not go in the cafeteria that day it was better for him to eat lunch um, in the teacher's lounge or eat lunch in my classroom on that day uh, than to have his peers see him vomit because of the smell of chicken noodle soup. So just, just things to think about. So I always like to think about breathing. Uh, it kind of could go with a couple of different categories, but I think it's something that we need to talk about specifically for kids with sensory processing issues. So we know breathing is also a powerful regulator. Um, it helps our body get back to a calm state. Uh, and if kids are upset, what do we say to them? Take three deep breaths, right? <laughs> so we know breathing is important because it affects our ability to pay attention. Uh, because if we're breathing correctly, then the oxygen is getting to our brain where we need it to. But we know that kids with disabilities and kids with sensory issues frequently don't breathe correctly. 
Um, it could be a body posture issue, it could be an anxiety issue, but we know that they may not be breathing and getting the oxygen to their brain where they need it to be. So we're going to talk about some ways to help kids learn to breathe. So some great ways to get kids breathing. Um, thinking about using straws. So I use straws, and by straws, I always mean the bendy plastic kind. Unfortunately, the kind that tend not to be so good for our environment. But they do make some nice paper straws or some nice um, compostable straws. Your straw should not be um, metal or really stiff because there's a risk of the straw going through the upper palate of a child. So just fair warning, <laughs> please be safe if you're using a straw activity with a child. Um, using straws, so getting them to blow ping pong balls with it or getting them to blow little pom-poms. If we were in person right now, I would give you a straw, um, a long straw and a short straw, and then a little pom-pom ball. And we would see how we blow them to get our breath. So I used that activity with students when I was teaching them to take a deep breath, right? Because we say that to kids all the time, take a deep breath but they don't know what it means. And so we have to physically teach that. So I taught it by giving them a straw and a little ping pong ball or a little pom pom ball, the, the little chenille kind that come in the package of a hundred for about $3. Um, we would put that on our table and then I would have kids use that straw to blow it around. I would make a target. I might have them blow it in a cup like it's a soccer game, but just practicing take a deep breath and then blowing it out through the straw so that they're directing that airstream towards some sort of item that they can move around on the table. Other things that might teach kids um, how to take a good deep breath, blow bubbles. So don't cheat and use automatic bubble blowers in this situation, but have them actually blow the bubbles. Um, blowing on pinwheels, any kind of activities that get kids um, taking in air and breathing them out. Uh, breathing it out uh, in a manner that um, has some control. So then you can practice. The other thing that I'd like to talk about at this point is, is that if you are telling kids, I need you to take a deep breath, then going to some kind of visual support, such as um, smell the flower, blow out the candle. There's some really good um, board maker on board maker share, or you could make your own. I've seen people have a physical fake candle and a fake flower, and so the child smells the flower and then they blow out the candle. So we're teaching them um, physically and visually how to take a deep breath. It's not this vague concept that uh, we may not understand. So just some good ideals for getting started with that. Auditory processing. So auditory processing is how we process what we hear. Um, for kids with sensory processing disorders, then they may hear everything. Um, everything is on super loud. So if there is tapping in your pipes in the wall, then they hear that sound. If there is um, just any kind of little random noises, then they're going to pick up on those easily in the background and they may not be able to block them out. So I have I feel like fairly normal auditory processing abilities and so if I am trying to concentrate or think most of the time I'm able to block out those um, miscellaneous background noises and uh, they don't necessarily bother me but for a child or an adult who struggles with auditory processing then they may not be able to move past those sounds. So if I have a student who is um, auditorily seeking out um, basic different noises, so I might offer them calming techniques of listening to music. Um, they may hum. If you see our kiddos who hum fairly constantly, um, they're seeking out that auditory sound. Um, if we need to block some noise, then you might try headphones or um, some sort of like iPod. Uh, type device that would help block out some sounds. Also, you can offer things like um, the hunting. Uh, if you go to the gun store and you buy the gun safe, um, the noise canceling headphones in the gun aisle, um, they're much cheaper than paying for the ones that say special education and they do the same thing. So they're about 
fifteen dollars versus forty five dollars in a special ed in a special education catalog. Um, making sure that they have a quiet work environment to work in. Um, nature sounds, so fish tank, uh, fountains, maybe outdoor like rain sounds might be very calming for them. If you're looking for um, alerting activities, so speak with a really animated voice and vary your loudness. So thinking about when you're talking with them, varying your tone, the quality of your voice and the loudness of it. Um, novel sounds might grab their attention. Um, the penny whistles uh, or something along those lines might be very effective.